Uh, hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about the analysis I did on some 19th century naval figureheads during a product, uh, project that I was doing at work between 2017-2019, when Orbis Conservation carried out the conservation of a collection of figureheads from the Royal Navy Devonport Docks collection for redisplay at a new museum in Plymouth. Conservation project, uh, project provided an opportunity to discover any extant paint layers below the coatings of resin and modern paint schemes that were on the heavily degraded figureheads. I was also given the opportunity to take comparative samples from figures from the um, Devonport collection that had been gifted to the National Maritime Museum. The aim of this research was to study the early polychrome schemes of these objects and support the hypothesis that rather more figureheads than were previously thought were painted in white when in service at sea. And where multiple white layers were present to establish a method of dating the paint. So the image many of us will have when we think of a ship's figurehead is a busty maiden on the prow of a ship, often decorated in a vivid colour scheme. But during my time working on the figureheads, I discovered that the scope of these objects extends well beyond this stereotype. They're often displayed in fairground style colours. The present aesthetic of these objects may also have strayed far from the original intention. Figureheads are not generally regarded as art objects, so there's been very few technical paint analysis carried out in the past. So the history of figureheads prior to the mid 18th century, lions had been the symbol of naval ships and they were usually painted yellow or brown or sometimes gilded. But on order of 20, um, of 1727, then allowed ships to display figureheads that had a relationship to the name of the vessel, and that led to a diverse range of characters and creatures. But figureheads fell out of fashion in the latter years of the 19th century as steel ships became the norm, and soon the old ships were being converted and broken up. And so figureheads started to accumulate at the naval dockyards, leading to the collections and maritime museums that exist today. The figureheads exhibited currently in many collections around the world tend to be overwhelmingly displayed in proper colours, like this one at the Cutty Sark. In a recent study for the Society for Nautical Research, naval historian David Pulvertov posits the theory that the assumption that figureheads were polychrome may not be historically accurate. In 1913, Douglas Owen carried out a survey of the figures that had been collected at the Devonport Dockyard, where he assumes that the white paint schemes that he observed were as a result of penny pinching by the Royal Navy. Standing solitary here and there in our dockyards, no longer in the splendor of their original coloring to save paint and wages. This assumption may be correct, or it may simply reveal that in the few decades between the breakup of the ships, and Owen's survey in 1913, the public perception of figureheads had already shifted to one of an exclusively richly decorated polychrome object. There is some limited photographic evidence of figureheads in the collection that we worked on having been painted in white. These are only really informative for, my, uh, for this study um, if the photograph was taken when the figurehead was still at sea as we can see with Defiance here. And also it's a bit blurry, but that's Tamar painted white on that ship. Such photographic evidence uh, also exists of two of the figureheads we worked on when they were um, displayed ashore. Um, and I think you can agree probably that they look a little bit better when they're monochrome than the later polychrome schemes that we see here. Figureheads would probably have been repainted often and Royal Navy records suggest that the paintings of ships was considered a vital process to preserve the timber from the elements. And ships in foreign service would have been repainted at least twice a year. It's not known whether the figureheads would have been regarded as part of the ship or treated slightly differently, but in order to preserve the timber, it seems certain that frequent repainting whilst in service would have been the norm.
whether the figures were routinely stripped of worn paint before redecoration or just painted over is also unclear. When I took samples from the figures, it became clear that in some cases, the timber had been thoroughly stripped before redecoration, especially as shown here uh, in figures where a resin layer had been applied. The modern paints are clearly visible above the resin in this cross section, the resin being the big white and the brown layer. And there's a few scant traces of a more historical pigment sometimes found below. But in some cases, I was more lucky in finding multiple layers of off-white paint that tested positive for lead and oil, seeming to back up the hypothesis that at least some of the figures had been repeatedly painted white in the past. Clearly, many layers of white paint precede the more modern color layers above. A lot of the color layers do not uh, test positive for oil um, and, um, well, some of them do test positive for oil, but they, they don't test positive for lead. These samples were taken from paint found uh, deep in the crevices of the carving. But it was not clear, however, if these lead white layers were applied when the figure was at sea or after it had been displayed on shore, because lead white, basic lead carbonate, was the most widely used pigment, white pigment of the period of the figurehead's manufacture, which was roughly the first half of the 19th century. But it was also the most widely used white pigment for many decades afterwards, only being completely banned in England in the 80s. So it is completely possible that the early lead layers on the figures are from much later periods than that of their first installation on the ships. And given that the figures may have been stripped in the past, it seems impossible to say for certain that we found original paint campaigns, unless we can date the lead layers. So how might it be possible to date multiple similar lead layers? Could the method of manufacture of the pigment be able to reveal anything about the chronology of the samples? From antiquity, lead white has been produced in much the same way. And by this period, the most common production practice was known as the Dutch or stack process, where lead is suspended in a pot and exposed to, exposed to acetic acid vapor from vinegar, which then produces a corrosion product of lead acetate on the surface of the metal. The pots were then placed in boxes and packed with horse manure and the manure as it decomposed produced a rich source of carbon dioxide and heat. After being left for about three months, the action of the heat in the carbon dioxide converts the lead acetate to basic lead carbonate. In the late 18th century, more scientific processes led to the development of chamber and wet precipitation methods. These processes were quicker than the stack method, but gave patchy results. And it was thought that precipitated lead white in particular lacked the opacity and covering power of traditional stack white. As a consequence, stack white continued to be manufactured till the end of the 19th century alongside these more modern methods. Many studies have been carried out which show the clear differences in particle morphology of a precipitated modern white lead paint and traditional stack process white. The stack process yields a pigment with a much larger and more varied particle size. Modern precipitated lead white particles tend to be regular and needle shaped, and sometimes they follow the direction of the brush strokes. Maybe this could help understand whether the pigment was a precipitated or a traditional white. This could be helpful in determining, in determining more modern layers. Yeah, and it could, but a stack endured through the period under discussion, this would be a vague distinction as both precipitated and stack process white coexisted for a long period. And that is exactly the same period as when my figure heads were first produced and put on the ships. So white lead consists of a mixture of lead carbonate, sericite and hydrocericite. In the 70s, studies suggested that the ratios of sericite to hydrocericite varied due, due to production methods. 
It was thought that the level of hydrocericite was much higher in lead white produced by the stack process. And in the 80s, prismatic particles of, of what are now considered to be a form of sericite were assumed to indicate more modern precipitation processes and were believed not to occur in paint from pre-1835. So this was used as a tool for dating. However, in more recent years, many research projects have found that the post-synthesis washing and grinding in acid or water can have a huge effect on the HC to C ratios present, and that prismatic particle morphology can also be affected by post-synthesis washing. So using these as an indicator of production methods is unreliable. Studies into radiocarbon dating of the inorganic carbonate component of lead pigments have also been attempted. And modern methods of manufacture can't be reliably dated, but stack process lead can be dated. The only trouble is it's in such broad age ranges of many decades that it would not be useful for this study. Perhaps the presence of datable additives and adulterants to the white layers may be able to provide a tool. So which pigments might I look for? Barium white, Due to its transparency in oil, the use of barium was limited mainly to water-based media until the 1820s, when it was investigated as a possible white pigment in oil. But the product having no body in oil was not recommended on its own. Thus, barium is not found alone in oil-based pigments, but was used widely as an extender. Barium sulfates first recorded as an adulterant in 1825, and recipes have been found with the most common ratio of three to one lead white adulterated with barium sulfate, known as Venice white. Barium sulfate went on to be the adulterant of choice from the mid-century onwards, preferred to chalk due to its whiteness in oil and its difficulty to detect. Zinc oxide was being developed as a pigment from the late 18th century, but it was used mainly as a watercolor pigment. Early trials with oils re revealed that the pigment's refractive index meant that it had poor hiding power. Trials were carried out in the early part of the 19th century, but the pigment appeared transparent in oil. And in addition, zinc oxide in oil did not dry well and became brittle. And although zinc did have the advantage of not darkening in sulfurous atmospheres, Due to these problems, zinc oxide did not gain popularity in, in common paints until around 1850, when it was used as an admixture. Zinc was then mixed with lead white and sold as leaded zinc as a ready mixed paint from the second half of the 19th century. Lithopone. In 1870, the pigment lithopone was developed as a non-toxic alternative to lead. Lithopone is a mixture of barium sulfate and zinc sulfide. The barium helped impart opacity to the zinc, giving it a much improved hiding power in comparison to zinc oxide alone. Lithopone proved popular due to its properties and low cost, peaking in use in the 1920s, after which time titanium oxide became the main alternative to lead. Titanium dioxide anatase type. Titanium dioxide was first explored and developed as a pigment in the early 20th century but not widely available as a manufactured commercial pigment until after 1919. So as some of the figureheads were made in the 1850s, the discovery of zinc or barium would not indicate a definite first layer. But if it were found on the first existing layer of a figurehead made before the mid-century, it would indicate that the figure had been thoroughly stripped and repainted at a date several decades after its first manufacture. The paint analysis was carried out, uh, including visible UV microscopy, SEM, EDX, and Raman. In total, including the samples from the National Maritime Museum, 12 figures were analyzed, resulting in hundreds of samples. So I haven't really got time to go through all my results here, but I've picked out a few examples to show you the kind of information I was able to glean. Initially, the samples were analyzed simply using visible light microscopy and microchemical spot testing to identify broad characteristics, such as the presence of lead and certain binding media. <clears throat> 
then using UV fluorescence to characterize pigments and binders. A useful tool when looking at multiple layers of very similar seeming white paint in visible light, UV microscopy is an inexpensive way of discerning layers containing zinc as it autofluoresces with a distinctive sparkling green. Further analysis was carried out using SEM. The analysis maps, the EDX maps, of, of show all the elements present in the layers. In this slide, we can see that there are two layers which contain zinc, clearly visible between the lead containing layers in the first map. The first layer seems to contain zinc as the main pigment, as there is little evidence of admixture as seen in the layer above where a certain amount of lead is present. This may be why in visible light, this layer has a strange transparent appearance, the RI of zinc making it transparent in oil. It would suggest a pretty unsatisfactory paint layer. We know that early experiments with zinc paints in the early part of the 19th century would be consistent with the figurehead's age, this figurehead having been made in 1833. An early zinc layer at this point in the stratigraphy would make sense. In this slide, we can see that the later layer, which contains zinc, also contains barium. So this might suggest a lithopone layer. And we know that lithopone came into common usage post-1870. So its position in the stratigraphy could be consistent with this development. Raman analysis was also used to identify pigments and materials present in the samples. Able to uh, target specific particles, Raman was used to characterize the black separation layers between the white layers. As you should see in the previous slide, there's a lot of black layers in between. Here, it's very apparent. And the dark layers were made up of coarse angular particles that turned out to be carbon consistent with a build-up build of airborne pollutants that would have been especially prevalent in an industrial dockyard setting before the Clean Air Act of 1956. So this suggests that the earliest known schemes mainly consisted of lead white in oil and subsequent layers were painted over accumulations of soot and dirt without any preparation of the surface. Um, and here is a, a picture of, um, on the left, is the lowest layer of lead white that I found on the sample from the Royal William Cloak, and the last um, existing layer of lead white from the same sample. The morphology of the early lead white layers is consistent with traditional stack process white being more clumpy and amorphous. While the last layer of lead white does have a more needle-like shape consistent with developments in pigment, pigment manufacture. There's no way of being certain that the first extant layer is the original paint scheme, but the number of layers present suggests that the existing historical paint record represents a significant amount of the object's history. It would therefore be safe to assume that for the greater part of its lifetime, this sculpture was painted white. This is also supported by the photographic evidence from the late 19th century when the figure was displayed on the dockyard. The presence of white pigment dating to post-1919 was also useful in determining, in determining the earliest extant layers could not have been applied when the figure was manufactured first or at sea. Um, in this one, you can see the early white layers but although those early layers are white and tested positive for lead, in the K-series map, uh, you can see the presence of titanium throughout the sample. So we could surmise that the figurehead had been stripped before repainting well after the date that he was carved in 1863. The color schemes of the treated figureheads were decided upon in collaboration with the client which was Plymouth City Council and the Royal Navy, despite clear indications that the earliest extant paint schemes on most of the figureheads that we treated, Sybil, Royal William, Defiance and Tamar, was indeed white, 
it was decided that monochrome schemes were not appropriate for the new display. I would have rather that they had been painted white, but the public perception of the figureheads has over the last hundred years become one of bold polychrome objects due to the past century of repeated redecoration. So it was agreed that where possible, the new paint scheme would reference the earliest extant color schemes found in the analysis. And in cases where there had been extensive stripping of paint, reference was made to a set of players' cigarette cards depicting the figureheads from 1912. The final paint schemes attempted to stick to a unified muted color palette and move away from the ultra high gloss and bright colors of previous modern paint schemes. The finish was agreed with uh, the stakeholders to convey a sheen and palette closer to a traditional oil-based paint. So in conclusion, the history of these objects meant that they've been treated very differently across the collection. Some have been stripped and some repeatedly overpainted, often in the ubiquitous and very difficult to date lead white. When multiple layers were present, elemental mapping pr provided a useful tool. Although I've been unable to categorically state that I have found original layers, the analysis can indicate whether pigments were available to painters of the period and help establish a probable chronology of application. The morphology of particles may also help when establishing more modern methods of lead white manufacture. When used alongside historical archive evidence, the analysis has helped lend weight to the theory that many figureheads were indeed painted white when originally upon their ship. So I'd like to thank everybody who helped me with this project and thanks to you all for listening. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Any questions? Thank you very much, Kirsty. I think that was really interesting. Um, do you have thoughts about why figureheads would have been painted white at sea? Do you think it was just for reasons of economy or did it have a practical function? I, th I don't think it was um, anything to do with saving money. I think it was probably an aesthetic decision because they look great when they're white. Um, and uh, when I've been researching, uh, I've read examples of people, um, you know, uh, on the ships uh, boasting about how white and sparkling their figurehead was compared to another ship's kind of greyish, you know, version and I'm, I'm not sure that it wasn't uh, just a decision made um, because it looked great and also uh, when you see them in white now like um, down at Portsmouth uh, some, some figureheads look fantastic they look very sculptural and I'm not, I'm not sure that it was yeah I don't think it was about penny pinching I think it might have just been an aesthetic consideration but that's my opinion. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know whether it's true. <laughs> I think you're now the expert on this. <laughs> well. <laughs> Anyone else? Any more, any more questions? Um, inevitably, I've got a question, Kirsten. Hello, Alex. How are you? Very well. How are you? Um, I, I kind of wondered, because some of those paint layers, they just look like there were so many layers. Mm. I know you said that you were digging them out of the kind of interstices, the buried away bits. I was wondering, was there no, did it, did, is there no record of people like sanding them off between? They just whacked them on. And then do you see that deformation? And then when you were doing your conservation, what do we do? Were you pre preserving all those layers? And just, yeah, that's what I was Well, thinking. yeah, we, we weren't able to preserve the paint layers, unfortunately. Um, in many cases, they've been stripped and those big chunks that I got that actually uh, gave me the most layers were were bits that were left really deep down in the interstices but um, also I think uh, you know where we were finding the black separation layers sort of suggest that they were just over painted again and again without sanding back in every case but the majority of um, the majority of figures that I worked on 
um, had been stripped and mucked about with a hell of a lot. Um, and I was just lucky to be able to get certain samples where I could, where there was a lot of paint. But obviously there were examples where the lead white was in the um, wooden substrate, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything because that could have been sanded back and reapplied at any point. It was very difficult to try and discern original paint yeah. layers. And they have been, I, if there's any object I've ever worked on that has been mucked about with, it's these. So. Yeah. They've been, yeah, look, they've been really used and abused. Yeah, it looks challenging. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Any more questions? Uh, yes, so could I just ask Kirsten, were you able to separate the paint layers in any way? Like when you did the SEM of the top white extant layer, or did you do it from the cross sections? No, I just did it from the cross sections because I was able to go in for very high magnification and isolate layers because they were pretty clear in um, on the screen. You could you could target a, a layer of its own because under such high magnifications, like what one thousand, you know, yeah, about one thousand, um, you can actually go into a single paint layer and and have a look at the morphology there. Brilliant. Thank you. I might have to talk to you in more detail. All right. Yeah. For my MA, because it's sort of similar, but nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay.